facing a real danger right now, that all this anger that has been unleashed is being channeled in the most destructive direction for this country. It's being channeled into demonizing each other, into defying us, and the angrier people get, the more, the easier it is to scapegoat particular segments of the population, whether it is immigrants, or Muslims, or Jews. It, this is like a matter of fact. It's happened throughout history. Uh, it happened in the 1880s when we were deporting Chinese workers. It happened in the 1930s under Hoover when we deported American citizens of Hispanic descent. It's happening again now when we have over 70% of Americans against building a mosque in New York, you know, that shows that something has gone very wrong if a particular group of our population can be so easily scapegoated. So what can we do with that energy that has been unleashed? It's real, you know, it's not just the Tea Party people who are angry, everybody's angry. And if you're not angry, you don't have a pulse. I'm very angry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to drink some water to calm down. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, speaking at the Teamsters Convention in Minneapolis a couple of weeks ago. And I realized as I looked down at the sea of faces that people were angry, but they were not allowing themselves to experience the anger because they didn't know who to be angry at. They didn't want to be angry at the Democrats because they know the Democrats are so infinitely better, you can't compare it. You can't compare them to the other side, which is basically, at the moment, having a nervous breakdown. I don't know how I want to describe what the solutions they're proposing, which are utterly laughable, right? So they know that, of course, if they take over the house, or if they have increased power, this is going to be a disaster for working people in this country. At the same time, they're angry. They're angry at their own party that has failed them. And it has failed them. There's no question about that. We have the White House, the House, and the Senate, and that's where we are. We have basically inadequate solutions versus laughable solutions. Mm -hmm. And so what do we do with that anger? If it's not expressed, it will destroy the relationship. Basically, the Democrats and the American people need to go into couples therapy. <laughs> <laughs> And couple therapy always starts with the acknowledgement of being angry, you know, or the acknowledgement of betrayal. There is a legitimate sense of betrayal here. And here are really the reasons that the people have a legitimate reason to be betrayed by, that this administration has been sending very confusing signals about what matters. It started a deficit commission instead of a jobs commission. And any economist that you respect, that you want to talk to, knows there is never any chance that we're going to solve the deficit problem if we don't grow our economy. And we're not going to be able to grow our economy if we don't create jobs. But we never had the sense of urgency that we had around saving the financial system, around jobs. We never came together and said, we cannot afford to have 26 million people out of work or underemployed, period. It's destroying this country, and it's allowing this anger to fester. We never said, let's try everything the way we did to prevent the financial meltdown. Republicans, you want a payroll tax holiday? Let's have a payroll tax holiday. Democrats, you want a big and bold infrastructure project, which we need anyway, otherwise we're going to have dozens of some Brunos all around America. Let's have that, and let's create real jobs that can create middle-class lifestyles again. Remember Homer Simpson? He's a middle-class fantasy now. Nobody in this country on one income would comfortably bring up five kids. Nobody. The way Homer Simpson did. So that's really what has been missing, and that's where the sense of betrayal comes from. So if we can take that energy and channel it in a creative direction. The only thing we can channel it immediately, because the only antidote to despair and anger is action, is rebuilding our communities. 
government in the next few months is not going to do anything important enough and bold enough to make a difference. Let's be frank. We are all going to continue to do our part to pressure government to make some incremental changes. But in the meantime, the most exciting and the most powerful thing going around the country is what people are doing on their own with building their communities. I have been so inspired discovering what is happening and the way people are using <coughs> social media to help themselves and help each other. And I'm just going to give you a few examples. I have plenty more in Section 5. It ranges from people out of work to people with a lot of resources. In the book, I cover the gamut from Susie Buffett, who is using all her resources to help rebuild Omaha, her own hometown. And she's treating it like a family, like if they want to close down the libraries over the weekend, she gives them a grant. If there is no preschool uh, ed <coughs> education worth its name, she gives it a grant. She was telling me yesterday that only 3% of Head Start eligible children get Head Start. Can you believe that? 3%. And I entitled my section around Susie Buffett, Find Your Own Calcutta, because that's what Mother Teresa was telling people when they were telling her that they wanted to go volunteer with her in Calcutta. She said, find your own Calcutta. Just look around you. And that's what Susie Buffett has done. And then it goes to the other end of Seth Reams, a concierge who lost his home in Portland, Oregon, two years ago. He filled 500 job applications and still could not get a job. So he decided instead to create a site called We've Got Time to Help Dog. And he basically became a hub for people with needs to ask for help and people with time on their hands, most of them out of work, to provide help. So I started speaking about him when I was on book tour. Dylan Radigan had him on his show. Then I talked about him on John Stewart. I talked about him on Bill Maher. He's now inundated with a request from over 50 cities to start similar uh, projects around the country. Now, the advantage of having unemployed people giving back is not only that these are real needs that are being filled, it's also it's changing the way they look at themselves. From seeing themselves as victims, they see themselves as contributors. And this is essential if they're not going to also become part of this anger wave. And so we flew Seth Rims into Washington uh, yesterday. He's going to be on Dylan Radigan's show this afternoon together with Susie Buffett and me. And I'm using both of them as the two examples of covering the gamble. In between, they're out of work lawyers. It started in Philadelphia, this movement, we're coming together to help others prevent foreclosure. And we saw in the last two weeks how many foreclosures can be prevented if you have a lawyer who can look at the paperwork and see how wrong often that paperwork is. And we have uh, out of work decorators who are decorating <coughs> homeless shelters because they have nothing better to do. But how great is that? <laughs> So we have an enormous amount of creativity. And also, you have sites like Etsy.com. I don't know how many of you have been there. Now, people go there and they create their own jobs. Instead of just applying for jobs, they find ways to create jobs for themselves. And some of these have become very successful businesses. There's a whole underground economy out there that's using social media and that's using each other and that's flourishing. So frankly, I see my job for the next few months. Well, I don't know what's going to happen beyond the next few months. But for the next few months, I'm an evangelist for this movement. I want to go around and put the spotlight on all the good things happening. Because I feel that's what we need more than anything, is to have a countervailing force to all the anger, the negativity, the divisiveness to demonstrate what can happen when we tap into the better angels of our nature. And this is also part of a larger um, inflection point, which John saw when I saw him the last time before he died, described as moving from epoch A to epoch B. We've talked about that before. 
She talked about moving from our survival-based life, which is basically based on pleasure and success, to our meaning-based life, which is based on collaboration, on giving back, on the pursuit of happiness the way the founding fathers intended it, which was never the pursuit of pleasure. Every philosopher and every religious leader will tell you that there is no real happiness in simply pursuing pleasure and success. And everybody who has succeeded knows that. So right now we have an opportunity out of this crisis to reevaluate what matters and rebuild our country on a stronger foundation than the foundation of consumption on which it had been based on. And this is an opportunity we cannot afford to miss. Thank you so much.